I would like to bring up uh, Dr. Uh, Tarab Lukman. Uh, he is from the Los, An uh, Los Alamos National Labs. And he has been focused on the theory and modeling and computation for proposed uh, matter radiation and in extremes. So the mic, I think, is attached to the computer, so we always get this change. Um, he's a signature faculty, which has recently been awarded as CD0 uh, by the DOE. He has led the computational materials uh, for XMATX and for the National Lab's co-design effort, leads, uh, leads all of their um, LNL on materials informatics. So this is another, so he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, recipient of Japan's Society of Promotion in Science Award in 2010, and also a fellow for outstanding research in science and engineering in, at Los Alamos National Labs. So today, I think he's talking about data challenges and opportunities for the next generation of materials innovation. And we'll and we'll get the infamous projectors to always work. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, and so let me uh, try to uh, tell you the scope of what I will focus on. So there are essentially two issues that I will, uh, two, two sets of problems that I will uh, tell you something about. So the first one relates to innovation in experimental material science uh, because in many ways that really will be the source of the data the increasing sizes of data that we will have to wrestle with. And that then will take me to Marie, matter, radiation, and extremes. So this is this very revolutionary concept that Los Alamos is uh, working on. Uh, so this is a decadal challenge in that this is an in situ facility with an XFEL, a free electron laser, designed to actually look at materials behavior. In other words, if you've got a material uh, it's being subjected to something or the other shock. You want to be able to see inside it to actually see what's happening. So imagine the amount of data that you can collect. So that's, uh, that's the first part of my talk. And then once you have all the nice data, clearly the challenge is to learn from the data. And so this will bring me to the whole aspect of materials informatics and design that we've been, we've been um, looking at uh, in so far as how do we do statistical design? How do we do informatics? And what, what is it that we can learn? I'll show you that uncertainties are very, very important. They really allow us to explore the search space. So it's all, it's all a matter of exploitation and exploration. And that's really how one can uh, find materials with targeted response. So I'll give you some examples. I'll focus on an alloy system, nickel titanium. I'll show you how we can find nickel titanium alloys with very, very small thermal dissipation by using this strategy. There are some other uh, examples that I have, piezoelectrics, light emitting diodes, but I won't have time to tell you about those. Okay, so that's really the scope of what I want to tell you about. Okay, so the first question that arises is, uh, do we really have a big data problem in material science? If you talk to experimentalists, uh, my friends tell me, look, I basically have you know, 10 data sets, I have 10 phase diagrams, I have 10 samples that I have synthesized, 10 solid solutions. This is not a big data problem, right? And so what you have to do is to start from there. However, uh, if we look at what's been happening, uh, this is really the landscape as far as the data is concerned. Uh, what you have is the, uh, in many ways, the closest to this, uh, to this, uh, to, to a lot of these activities is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. That really is, it's, it's closest because that's also an experimental facility. And in many ways, that's really the benchmark. They've got a very, very nice data portal. Uh, they've got a lot of experience. And if you talk to them, they will tell you that the challenge really is in how you, I mean, they process a lot of data, but processing is one aspect. Another aspect is collecting the data, okay? So what they see are hundreds of millions of collisions. 
they use certain criteria, dirty criteria, to essentially look at one event in a thousand. And it's really from that one event in a thousand that they make certain conclusions. So this, in many ways, provides some measure of what the landscape is like. Uh, it's estimated that in the year, by, by 2025, uh, in the next upgrade that they actually foresee, the amount of data will increase by 20-fold. Right now, for example, the velocity of the data approaches something like 25 gigabytes per second. So that's the scope. That's really the big data problem. Now, in material science, here is sort of my rendition of the materials data landscape. The kind of problem that I will tell you about in so far as being able to do informatics and design is that little speck right there, one gigabyte. That's just basically a small amount of data. Uh, I'll tell you something about APS, HEDM, so this is high, res high resolution electron diffraction microscopy, uh, of the order of a terabyte, okay? If you take a lot of data, several samples, it's sort of 10, 10 terabytes. Uh, EBSD, you're not really using a light source there. It's all basically done on site of the order of two gigabytes per sample. Really, the future in terms of collecting data lies in new experimental facilities, light sources. Okay, so that's really where the action is. So APS is an example currently, so this is really the current state of the art. But then LCLS, this is at SLAC, so this is the XFEL facility, coherent extra diffraction, where you can actually get beautiful spatially as well as time resolved data. That really is sort of of the order right now, five terabytes per beam time. So this is some guy going, he's got beam time, he basically takes one sample, essentially can sort of take, collect data, you know, uh, uh, for five different fields or stresses. Uh, and I'll give you an example of what actually you can learn by doing that. LCLS2, so that's the upgrade in the next five years, 100 terabytes per beam time. This is Marie. So that's the facility I'm gonna tell you something about that really is of the order, sort of tenfold, okay? So that's in the next decades per beam time. So this, in our view, is sort of the landscape. Now this is, by the way, a logarithmic scale. So that's why you see a, uh, this sort of slight discrepancy in the sizes of these things. So that's LHC there, there's Google there. So this gives you the scope of where material science lies. So yes, we are going to be moving to an era where we will have large amounts of data. But the contention is that a lot of this data will come from experimental facilities such as these, okay? Um, <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about sort of the current state of the art in terms of where the, what, what sort of data are we dealing with and what are we learning? So high throughput calculations uh, as well as high throughput experiments is a source of data right now. And the kind of data sets you're dealing with are of the order of gigabytes. And let me then go on to the terabyte, so that's a big jump, uh, in current, in today's current facilities. So this is sort of the high throughput calculations. So this is what uh, Bryce sort of does very well, Citrin. Uh, in my view, so the whole idea is you collect data of a lot of different materials and you're interested in all those different properties. Uh, this I view very much as a static data set. This is really not dynamic in any way. Okay, you may add one material, two materials, uh, you know, every week to this data set. But it's essentially a stationary data set. You've got uh, something, uh, for example, OQMD, you've got of the order of 300, 400,000 compounds. Uh, they're all sort of part of ICSD anyways. Uh, and so that's, but, but it's, it's a very useful thing to do because uh, you can learn something from the data. And the way you learn from this data is really by screening. Okay, so here the emphasis is on generating data, and then screening to learn something. As distinct from another strategy that I'll tell you something about, where I actively ask the question, what are the next experiments I need to be able to do to find a material with a targeted property? Okay, so that's high throughput calculations, but high throughput measurements are also very important, and so there's some very beautiful work 
being done in this area by, by Chiro Takuchi in particular. And so here the idea is that you uh, be, have a parameter space, okay, uh, that you want to span and get enough data on, and then you want to hone in on the region that is of interest. So this is a very good way to screen. It's a first cut. And then you go and, uh, uh, well, typically what's, what's done is that you essentially have some sputtering guns. You may have three species sputtering guns. You have a thin film, and it's natural to do that. And it's rapid, uh, a rapid sort of characterization. So when one, uh, uh, one uh, zap, you can actually get out, you can do diffraction, get out the lattice parameters. If you know the lattice parameters, then you can say something about elastic compatibility and what have you, okay? Uh, spectroscopic measurements as well, that, uh, you can also do that. Uh, so this is very nice, but again, the data sets are of the order of gigabytes. Uh, but then you have a big jump. A jump in that the data sets now are of the order of terabytes tens to hundreds of terabytes. And here, the whole idea is, and it's a challenging problem, what you're doing is reconstructing microstructure, okay? So you basically uh, shine uh, photons, the light source, in, uh, to a given layer, and by layer by layer, you build this microstructure, reconstruct the microstructure. It's very, very slow. The analysis, as I will show you, is brute force. It uh, takes a lot of effort, uh, and, uh, but it's, it's, of course, very beautiful because it, it tells you a, lo a lot about the crystal orientations. And then imagine being able to do this in situ, where you put a load on and you make it deformed and you see how the deformation progresses. Uh, if, I look, if I show you the workflow associated with that problem, uh, it shows you the complexity that you're dealing with. You know, you've got 360 angles, uh, this is only 50 layers. You've got three distances, far field, near field, somewhere in between. Uh, 54,000 measurements, okay, of these diffraction patterns. So that's your data set. And then, of course, what you have to do is you have to calibrate the model. You've got to do some forward modeling here. You've got to calibrate the model, and then you've got to be able to find the crystal orientations that correspond to the diffraction pattern that you have. So this is a very time-consuming problem. So some of the informatics tools that I will tell you something about, we're actually using those to alleviate some of the bottlenecks in the analysis. We want to be able to show that we can actually speed this process up rather than doing it the way it's currently being done by brute force. Okay, in the spirit of this workshop, this is a really beautiful example. This is cutting edge. So we want to be able to use a light source to precisely in situ monitor the additive manufacturing process, okay? So let me show you the movie here. So this is laser welding. And uh, you should see it coming. So the wheel is moving. You've got a wheel. It's moving around at a certain rate, and you're laying down material. Okay, so there is a torch there that's laying down material, and what you've got is a light source that is going to interrogate what's happening to the material. It's all in situ. So what you're doing is, so this is the sort of deposition, you're just, it's just showing you, so this is the wheel uh, that's moving. Uh, there should have been a, something at the bottom. It didn't come out. Um, okay, that's fine. So, uh, so, so this is sitting on a wheel uh, that's actually moving, and what you're, what, this, is the, this is the torch. So what you're doing is you've got a diffraction spot here, you've got another diffraction spot here, a diffraction spot here. These are the diffraction patterns associated with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the process. And so you can see here what's happening is it's essentially molten, liquid, it's very diffuse. As you go a little bit, here, you're starting to see some of the peaks, the signatures of the crystallization process, and then thereafter you see well-defined peaks, okay? Uh, so it's in situ monitoring of, of, the, of the diffraction patterns from which you can infer things like residual stresses and so forth. So this is a nice example of what we can do, and clearly the data sets are fairly large. 
Uh, they're of the order of uh, hundreds of terabytes. And this is just being done right now by my colleague Don Brown at Los Alamos. Okay, so now we come to what, is, what are the sort of next generation facilities going to look like? So we just saw that you want to learn about processing and how the processing affects the structure, which is what you uh, learn by doing the diffraction. Clearly the next step is going from the process to a more product-based uh, uh, setup, whereby you really want to learn about the properties that you're interested in, in controlling. And so this is where Marie comes in. So this is uh, 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 Marie, which is a facility. It's a, of the order of $2.5 billion over the next uh, decade uh, that Los Alamos wants to build to be able to uh, monitor materials behavior in situ, okay? And it uses a free electron laser, XFEL. Why? Because really it's only the coherence of the X-rays uh, which give you the brilliance and the high repetition rate that will allow you to have the kind of time resolution that you need to be able to monitor what's happening as a function of time. So imagine snapshots at picosecond, nanosecond intervals, you can control that um, over time, okay? So you can sort of, in one millisecond, you can sort of get a whole bunch of different snapshots separated by, say, 100 picoseconds. That's what you want to be able to do to monitor whether, you know, what's happening, how the material is behaving, how it's transforming, et cetera. And it's a, it's a multi-probe, so you've got information at different scales, okay? So you've got protons, you've got x-rays, uh, electrons, and so you can sort of take a continuum image using protons, and the XFEL will give you a lot of fine structure. So multi-probe tool uh, to be able to do that. So let me tell you now what we can actually do today. So LCLS at Slack is an example of a free electron laser. Now it's very, very good for th thin films, molecules, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you know, that's why it has, it has had so much success but it's a coherent source. What Marie will do is, Marie will have the ability to do bulk samples. It's a much higher energy X-ray, 42 kV. Uh, but this is an example of what we can do now. It's really seeing inside. So it's a nanoparticle. It's about 19 na uh, 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 nanometers, uh, and it's a ferroelectric. Okay, ferroelectrics are very important because uh, you're dealing with polarization, switching, they're very important for FE RAM, ferroelectric RAM. And what you want to do is you want high, large, high density, okay? So the way you get high density is by taking nanoparticles and essentially building arrays. And so the idea is to study a nanoparticle like this. Now, because it's polarization, it's a vortex. So this is an example of a vortex. Uh, it's got a dislocation line. It's got a core that's like a dislocation line in the inside. So you're seeing a, a, a sort of vortex nanoparticle being imaged, and now you can take slices. So these are slices inside this guy, okay? And you can see that under the action of a field, this vortex center actually is sort of, you know, shifting in the medium itself. So this is beautiful because I can exactly see inside. It's 3D imaging. And you've got all the beautiful data. This is what we can do now. This requires about, this, will, this sort of generates about uh, one and a half terabytes of data per sample. So, so, so this is the state of the art, okay? And so where we're going is, uh, so we've been working on Marie, at least I've been working on Marie since 2008. We've got it to the point where the critical decision zero has been, uh, has been approved. Uh, and it's now going through, you know, there's a whole process when you build facilities, has to go through CD1, CD2, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it's going to be on the MESA. It's, it's in fact, really, we're going, one is going to use the Proton Linac at, at Los Alamos right now and then build around it. So this is the new facility to come, which in, in many ways will then sort of replace lands which we've had for the, for the last 40 years. It's a user facility. So that's where we're going. So in terms of data, where na whereas now we basically get one visor 
flat. So that's a velocity profile when you do a shock experiment, okay? Uh, you know, you basically get one every few days. With Marie, we will be able to get hundreds of these, okay? And that's where the large data starts to enter in this game. So that's where we're heading towards. And of course, the integration, this co-design loop is very, very critical. Okay, so now that we've got all this data, we want to do something more, we want to learn, right? So my first point relates to how do we accelerate the discovery process by guiding experiments towards finding materials with targeted properties. So that's what I will address, and then I will just show you uh, how we can use very similar methods to look at data from facilities. Okay, like for example, APS. Uh, and here, uh, right. And so, you know, the kind of data that I'm talking about here is very, very small. And so the best way to sort of show you how we've been sort of doing this is by an example. So here's my example. Uh, I want to find a alloy, happens to be nickel titanium alloy, with the lowest uh, hysteresis, thermal, thermal hysteresis. Okay, so now, as you probably know, nickel titanium is a shape memory alloy. So that simply means that I essentially prepare it in some shape, uh, give it some shape. I, I, I sort of look at it in the martensite phase, low symmetry phase, and then I can deform it to my heart's content. But when I then heat it up across the transition, the structural transition, it recovers the shape that was given to it. It recovers the, those strains, okay? The way you monitor that is through differential scanning calorimetry. And so you basically look at the heat flow. So you heat, you get a you heat and, and you cool, you get essentially a peak. The hysteresis is the interval between those two, right? So for a material, what you, what, what you want is to minimize that hysteresis. Why do you want to minimize that hysteresis? Because that's what affects fatigue. And you want something that can go through many, many cycles without fatigue. That's your target. That's what you want. How are you gonna do this? So, um, uh, so here for example is nickel titanium, okay, which is, which is uh, uh, used in industry a lot. Uh, and you can see that the spread is of the order of 25K, okay, with cycles. And also the interval, this delta T, is also of the order of 25, 30K. So our strategy was, okay, we're looking for a multi-component alloy with very, very small thermal hysteresis. And so our domain knowledge told us that we're gonna restrict ourselves to this family. We have a good idea as to what copper does, what palladium does, and what iron does in terms of how it affects the transition, temperature, uh, et cetera, okay? So there was a lot of work that was done um, on sort of, you know, on alloys such as this with varying amounts of X, Y, and Z. So we had 22 samples, and th this was already done in the literature, but we set out to do it ourselves. So we did the experiment ourselves in a very controlled fashion. The processing was really controlled. The same guys did the experiment um, and uh, measured the thermal hysteresis, this delta T. Uh, now, so the problem is very simple. I wanna know what is X, Y, and Z which will minimize the hysteresis. That's my problem, okay? And clearly, the space is very large. So our experimental friends had the ability to control the composition to 0.1%. So if I use that, the search space, the number of possibilities of X, Y, and Z is of the order of 800K. So now what you're doing is you're looking, you know, you've got this vast search space and you want to find which, what particular composition is going to minimize the thermal hysteresis? That's the problem. And how are you gonna do it? The key point is that uncertainties are very, very important. They will allow us to, in many ways, search that vast search space. So the strategy that we came up with is this. Um, we essentially start with our compositions. We identified the material descriptors or the features, and here domain knowledge was very important. 
we, know, we knew from the literature that things like the valence electron number per atom is important. It affects the thermohysteresis. It affects the transition temperature. There's a lot of work published. Uh, atomic, the, the radii of the, of the, of the chemistry, the, uh, the species is also important. So we've essentially uh, down-selected a set of features. We didn't want the feature list to be too large because that really explodes the sort of degree of difficulty in terms of the dim uh, high dimensionality of the problem. You want it to be small, yet you want it uh, to, to be able to say something. Uh, then what we did was to essentially do what everybody else does. You do inference. So this is when people talk about materials informatics, this is really what they mean. I'm going to do some kind of regression. Okay, you can use your favorite toolbox uh, off the web, scikit-learn, and you will do inference. That's what I mean there. Uh, but the key point that we realized was that it's really the design that's critical. How do we choose the next experiment, the next sort of experiment that has to be done? Okay, This is not a one-shot deal. I make a prediction, here it is, good for you. You really have to iterate. So you make, you make certain predictions, you, you suggest certain uh, alloys for the experimentalist to do, and we uh, uh, suggested four, so that in itself is a nice informatics problem. What are the best four that you should suggest? And then the experimentalist goes and makes them. We then put that back, it augments the data set, the training data, and we keep going. This is how we iterated to actually come up with the solution to this problem, okay? Now, before I give you the solution to this problem, uh, you know, th I wanna make this point, come back to this point. So, inference is really not adequate by itself. You really need to explore. So, uh, let's see, what, are, what is one doing when one does inference, regression? Okay, you're imp you've, got a, you've got some data set somebody's given you, and what you're empirically doing is constructing some function, f of x can be uh, least squares, for example. You know, you've all done least squares, right? So, so on, the, on the left there, I have a plot of exactly something like that, where I'm showing you for the 22 compounds that, uh, that I showed you, I have the predicted delta T against the measured delta T. And you'll say, oh, that's pretty good. I already have a nice model. And clearly what I'm looking for is small delta T. So what may occur to you is that, hey, I have an outlier. You see right there, large uncertainty. And anyway, I'm looking for small delta T. Uh, that's not so important. I don't want to sample there. You're, you will be tempted to basically throw that away. Bad. Okay? Uh, because uh, there's a large uncertainty associated with it, and you don't know what's going to happen in the next step. Let me tell you what actually happens in the next step. We, we, we sort of, we predicted four, and so, uh, the, uh, the, the one, this one still allows for a small delta T. It still allows for it, but I don't know what the result is. So we went and, 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 and synthesized the compounds. Three of them very nicely obeyed the model, but the fourth one, essentially, the, the, predict, the measured one was quite large. Okay, so that tells you in, in subsequently that that's not going to be important. But a priori, you don't know that. What this is telling you is that there is a landscape in feature space which has local minima. And it's very important for you to explore this to be able to get the sort of best uh, global minimum if you can. And you mustn't throw stuff away because then you're not exploring, you're not getting the best results. It is suboptimal. And we can actually show that because what we did was to give, give ourselves a, a, a test problem. I have a, a data set, this happened to be max phases, of 220 compounds. And then I basically ask myself, and, and, I, and I know the elastic moduli, I ask myself, I want the compound with the largest elastic modulus. Let's do it. And so this is number of new measurements against the initial number of measurements in your training data. Now if all you do is randomly, it's bad. Okay, so nobody likes to do things randomly. But if you do them using inference, what usually people do in materials informatics, then you can see that what you will get, so that's pure exploitation, you will get something like this. But the best result is when you actually do statistical design. So you can see it doesn't matter which strategy you use in statistical design, 
Um, they all work reasonably well, and they give you the best results. Within 35 new measurements, I can get the best, uh, I can get the compound with the best modulus. Okay, so that basically brings me to this uh, slide, which really is not new. Industry has really known about this for a long time, and the operations community has known about this for a long time. It's really a matter of using uncertainties to sort of balance the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Uh, this happens to be a Gaussian process model, and what you see here are the data points where you don't have uncertainty, you know the stuff, but where you don't have data points, you have these footballs of uncertainty, and that's where you need to go and explore. Okay, very important. And as I said, a lot of these ideas are not new. They've been used in the aerospace industry, also in the auto industry. Uh, they come, uh, the classic ideas that go back to Howard and Kushner 30, 40 years ago uh, on the value of information. And so they recognize that what's important if you want to, uh, if you have complex calculations that are going to take a, many, many days, you really need to choose the best infill points. You really need to address the issue of what are the best response surfaces. So a lot of this goes under the heading of surrogate-based modeling. And all we did was to take those lessons from these guys and actually implement them on materials data sets. So this is the result that we got from our study. The alloy that we found, which had the smallest thermal dissipation is right there. I certainly wouldn't have been able to find that otherwise. And we got it in the sixth iteration. So in our actual uh, exercise, we went through nine loops. We made 36 predictions because we were giving four each time. So we, uh, we synthesized 36 compounds. 14 of them were better than the best in our training set. And so the p-value is very small. There's no way that we could have found this compound on a random basis. If you want to know how good it is, uh, this shows you that the shift in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the temperature in, in delta T over 60 cycles is very, very small compared to something like nickel titanium. And one of the things to point out is that our compound is, is very competitive in the, in the landscape of compounds. But notice that uh, the, the, the transition temperature is also in the right window. Now, we didn't design for that. That was fortuitous. But it shows you that the right way to do these things is through multi-objective optimization. OK, so this strategy we have subsequently been using to address the problem of, that the facilities care about, the whole problem of reconstruction, okay? Uh, where I want to sort of choose very, very fast. I want to get very, very fast the orientations, the crystal orientations, which will match the detector pattern. Because that's what you care about in the microstructure. I want the crystal orientations. And so we've actually implemented this, and it works very, very competitively. Uh, let me not, uh, this is just to show you uh, how we actually do it, but let me not focus on that. Uh, let me summarize. So, um, the, the big warning here is the no free lunch theorem, okay? Uh, materials informatics uh, uh, is really uh, fraught with a lot of issues. And there's a very famous theorem called the no free lunch theorem, which basically says that there is no universal optimizer. Something that I do on a given data set, a model that I come up with for a given data set, there's no assurance that that's going to work on a slightly different data set. Okay, no assurance at all. So you have to be exceedingly careful. This, there are no results to guide you here. In classification, for binary classification, you have a result that can actually guide you, but here there are no results. So you really have to be very, very careful. Things like when you have small data sets, Things like cross-validation don't work very well. The bioinformatics people really know this well because they've got few patients and they've got uh, uh, you know, thousands of genes, a very large feature space, and that's fraught with a lot of uh, difficulties. And so you have to use these methods very carefully. But one thing we have found is that the design, this exploration, exploitation start strategy, really, in some sense, uh, make, um, makes amends for the lack of an adequate uh, inference model. That's a very interesting thing. Usually people just want a good regression model. We've discovered that the design element actually 
uh, is quite forgiving of the, of the, of the inference model. Uh, you know, what I've talked about is a data-driven approach, but I think that's not adequate. We really need to bring in theory. We need to bring in uh, theory and relationships, constitutive relationships, scaling relationships to constrain the search space. And how we do that is a, an outstanding challenge. So I, 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 think, I think it's data-driven plus knowledge that should give better predictions rather than just data-driven by itself. Um, of course, I have left out everything to do with exascale computing. Uh, clearly, the high-performance computing angle is an important one that needs to be incorporated in all of this as well. But uh, you know, there, are, there are a lot of synergies there as well. Good, thank you very much.